So I would like to introduce Dave Anderson. He's the director of the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, and I've had the great good fortune to be able to work with Dave during the course of this um, planning this conference and an opportunity to get to know him better. So he's going to talk about the natural history of Colorado, and I cannot think of anyone better to do that. Well, thanks a lot, Terry. Um, this is a tremendous honor and a huge thrill to get to be here and talk with you all. Um, and I wanted first to just kind of acknowledge the miracle that has happened here at this conference. Um, every, usually when I go to a conference this size, there's another David Anderson, but this time there's another David G. Anderson. And uh, I'm Gust, if you need to distinguish us. And I started thinking that maybe we're actually part of some covert experience to test whether Schrodinger's cat is real, and maybe we're actually the same person. So that's gonna be interesting to meet David G. Anderson today. Um, so, uh, let me see how I pass the intelligence test here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the natural history of Colorado today and try to sort of set the stage for your visit here to Colorado. Um, and uh, just as a disclaimer, I'm a, I've been a botanist uh, most of my life until I became an administrator. And um, so my emphasis has not been on the big fuzzies. I think the big fuzzies will be covered elsewhere in this conference, so um, hope that doesn't disappoint anybody. Um, and I have always loved um, the old natural history literature that's very flowery language and has these incredible titles that are a significant fraction of the entire document itself. And so this is one of one that I found on the internet, uh, The Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne in the County of Southampton, um, to which are added the naturalist calendar, observations of various parts of nature, and poems. And, <laughs> So I wanted to offer you my own title in this spirit of uh, natural history uh, observation. Um, so my actual title is The Natural History of Colorado, wherein is contained the whole discourse and description of the landscape, its history, and changes over time, and the species occupying this region, their relationships to each other, and manner of assembling into repeating patterns on the landscape, particular noteworthy taxa, and stories of leading explorers, and a poem. <laughs> so. Um, that, that, that pretty much covers it, but here's, here's sort of breaking that down a little further. We're going to talk about what natural history is, and as a director of a natural heritage program, that question of the difference between natural heritage and natural history was something I wanted to really learn more about. We're going to look at the deep history of Colorado, um, its geology and our ancient climates, beasts, and landscapes, and then we're going to um, move into the present and think about the future a little bit, looking at key ecological systems of Colorado and the denizens thereof, the changing face of Colorado, and then we will not talk about dead white guys, and we will not have enough poems. <laughs> so um, the natural history of Colorado, uh, OK, what is natural history? And sort of boiling down the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of natural history, it is observation-based information about plants and animals, the places they live, and the ways they interact. And I think that observation-based piece is a, a critical part of that, that we are observing the environment. It's not so much an experimental approach as, as uh, other sciences are. Um, natural heritage. Um, it refers, according to Wikipedia, the, uh, the sum total of the elements of biodiversity, including flora and fauna, ecosystems, and geologic structures. And it is a concept sort of based in our inheritance, that the natural heritage is what we have inherited from our predecessors and that is ours to be the stewards of. And it predates the term biodiversity. It was apparently coined by Lyndon B. Johnson and then embraced by President Carter. And the Nature Conservancy really took hold of this term when it decided to launch uh, the network of natural heritage programs that now exist all across the Western Hemisphere and, um, and that are now under the uh, membership of uh, NatureServe. And so our program here in Colorado was one of those programs. Um, and it's interesting that some of the natural heritage programs have natural history in their title because what we do is really natural history observations as a heritage program. Um, so I'll kind of just give you 
quick overview of what we do as heritage programs. A lot of you know this already. Um, we focus on what species and communities we should be paying attention to within the, the jurisdiction that we operate. And we work on find, figuring out where they are located to help support conservation efforts and help make decisions on where we should have natural areas, where, where should conservation happen. And we keep track of how they're doing because we want to save the very best populations and, and uh, um, ecosystems. And we roll that up to help identify places and landscapes that really demand our attention if we want to conserve biodiversity. And doing that is an enterprise that uh, involves the careful documentation of natural history. Um, my, here are my daughters long ago off to go do that. Um, using the traditional tools of the trade. And uh, um, a critical part of this are our natural history collections. And this is the New York Botanical Gardens uh, Herbarium. Um, and uh, when we're doing this, we need to be careful. This is a rare plant in Colorado, um, Malaxis brachypoda, one of our 21 orchid species of Colorado. And um, it's only ever been known from three tiny populations. Um, and only one of those is evidently extant now. Um, and in my research on this plant, um, there are way more squished Malaxis brachypodas on herbarium sheets than there ever have been observed on the ground. Um, and, you know, this is from the time when uh, uh, Mr. Audubon went birding with uh, binoculars and a gun and you know, we, our, our ethos about this has changed and we're being more careful about how we collect and how we document nature. But I guess this is still something we all need to think about and make sure we're not collecting um, from very small populations. Um, so, but don't stop collecting. Thank goodness we have these natural history collections because that's the basis on which uh, our knowledge rests in very important ways. Um, so, you know, as we deploy the tools of the trade in pursuit of our understanding of natural history, um, we are using the traditional tools and we're getting some really exciting new tools like eDNA that we're kind of excited to try out in Colorado in our wetlands um, that allow us to detect organisms based on very trace quantities of DNA in the environment. Um, this is cool stuff. Uh, you know, the, 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 this is a really wonderful moment for the study of natural history that we have tools like this. Um, so uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm, I'm kind of going to walk you through Colorado's uh, history and, and our, our ecological systems and our, our kind of uh, through a regional uh, tour of the state, um, looking at these three regions, the eastern Colorado Plains, the Colorado Rocky Mountains, and the western Colorado Valleys and Plateaus. Um, and uh, an interesting thing to note here is that Colorado is mostly not forested. About 21% of Colorado is forest. Um, but let's, let's go way back in time here. We're going to look at uh, the geology map of Colorado. And it's kind of an amazing place that um, because of the Laramide orogeny that took place from about 80 million years ago to 35 million years ago, we have the Rocky Mountain spine going through our state, which has exposed two billion years of geology, about a third of the entire Earth's history's geology is exposed somewhere in Colorado. And this has led to a tr tremendous diversity of different habitats and is, is responsible for the high biodiversity and high rate of endemism that we have in Colorado. Um, oh, and uh, you know, like all of you, um, I have always loved to go to natural history museums and enjoy the dioramas in, in those museums. And so I recreated one here for you uh, <laughs> meticulously. Um, and so this is the Jurassic of Colorado. And um, these four uh, groups here, the um, Allosaurus, Brachiosaurus, um, a crocodilian, and this guy um, is Stegosaurus armatus, our uh, state fossil. We have a state state dinosaur here in Colorado. And you can see remains of all four of these beasts at um, Dinosaur Ridge, which is one of our state designated natural areas in Colorado's natural areas program system, just west of Denver. So if you're hanging around in Colorado after the conference, this is a fun adventure. I really like going to this place. And um, so uh, this was about 140 million years ago. Um, then, uh, you know, 
moving forward to about 65 million years ago, um, in Colorado, we have uh, remains of the Triceratops and the Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and we also started to have the evolution of grasses um, at that time. Um, so, uh, so these are also, uh, you can go see these down near Dinosaur Ridge at a place called Triceratops Trail. And uh, um, rex, I mean, oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, you just try to give a professional talk, and uh, then you put Rex in it, and it just gets like this all the time. Um, I sense that more than a few of you share my frustration on this right now. Um, so uh, Triceratops Trail is close to Dinosaur Ridge. You can go check that out if you're interested in dinosaurs. Um, and after the um, Chicxulub event that wiped them out and left a, um, evidence of that impact in many places around Colorado, the, the um, KPG boundary is, can be seen in, in lots of our uh, uh, lots of places in Colorado. Um, uh, the current flora that that you see here began to evolve, and uh, um, elements like the ponderosa pine began to evolve at this time. And uh, so um, then something happened that Colorado doesn't get enough credit for. Um, everyone thinks big volcanic eruption. They think, oh, Yellowstone. And uh, that one was big, but ours was three times bigger. Um, the La Garita event 27 million years ago was the largest volcanic eruption ever documented on the face of the Earth, ever, ever known. Um, and that happened right here. This is the La Garita caldera here, this large brown blob. The other brown blobs are other uh, cataclysms that happened um, at, around that same time. Um, and so, the way that I've tried to get my mind around this is to sort of imagine what uh, 1,500 cubic miles of stuff exploding all at once might be like. I think, you know, try to picture all the mountains that you can see on the horizon here just going kablooey all at once. And that's what this was like. It was unbelievable. So you can see evidence of this at the Wheeler Geologic Area, which is another state natural area here in Colorado. Um, so uh, the ice ages, there's really no talking about Colorado's natural history without thinking about our ice ages. And some of you who are going up to Rocky Mountain National Park are going to see some of the evidence of uh, the glaciation that took place in Colorado. Um, we have these cirques almost everywhere you go in the high mountains. Um, we have a lot of other cool ice age stories here too, like uh, here at High Creek Fen, which is a nature conservancy preserve in South Park, the, the actual South Park. Um, uh, we um, have a, a Pleistocene endemic species, Primula galaxensis, that has a sort of a circumboreal distribution and just barely gets down to Colorado, and we think it was more common here during the Ice Age. So uh, we're kind of getting up to the present here now. Um, we'll uh, start our tour out on the east slope. I know many of you started your tour here that way, so that seemed to make sense. Um, coming in to Colorado from the east, and we'll go over the mountains to the west and, and see what we see. Um, we have uh, about 10,000 feet of elevation um, change in Colorado from the 4,000 feet in the far eastern plains up to 14,000 feet. So uh, starting in the eastern plains, um, we have two dominant ecological systems there, the shortgrass prairie and the sand sage. Um, the sand sage is in sandier sites. Um, and there's really no talking about the eastern plains without talking about the boss of the plains, the bison. And uh, those of you who are going on the field trip to Soapstone are going to get to see these guys. They were released in November 2015 in a homecoming event that was really fun. Um, it was really cool to watch these things thunder out of their uh, confinement out onto the plains for the first time in um, a long, long time, over 100 years. Um, and the eastern Colorado Plains is a really important place for uh, grassland birds. We have a lot of grassland birds that are species of concern. And we um, recently named one of our potential conservation areas the Fritz Knopf Prairie um, in honor of uh, Fritz Knopf, who was a scientist who passed away in 2015, who really helped us understand what's going on um, in terms of birds and the grazing regime of the Great Plains. Um, 
And so along this grazing gradient, whoopsie, we have uh, different bird species that um, uh, prefer different uh, grass heights. And this grazing regime historically was imposed by bison and prairie dogs. Um, today, we are now uh, trying to manage to recreate those conditions using, using cattle in most places. Um, and so some of the uh, species of interest out on the plains um, include this uh, listed, in listed, listed threatened plant, the Enothera coloridensis, subspecies coloridensis, that you're going to go maybe see up at Soapstone. I'm not sure if you're going to this site up there, but it lives at Soapstone. Um, and of course, the keystone species of black-tailed prairie dog and the, and, uh, the burrowing owls that live in their colonies. Um, Swift fox is a rare fox that needs, these, needs big landscapes uh, to remain viable out on the plains. And, uh, and of course, the lesser prairie chicken whose populations have declined to next to nothing here in Colorado now. These are some of our really interesting species in Colorado. And we've got, so uh, Fritz Knopf Prairie is an amazing place and Soapstone is amazing. And this place is a, a place that we started working at um, in around 2009. Um, it's a ranch that is now uh, owned by the Nature Conservancy. Um, it was purchased recently by them. Uh, it's a 50,000 acre ranch that really is worthy of being a national park. It's unbelievable. And this is in southeastern Colorado. And most people don't even know that southeastern Colorado looks like this. We have these, this incredible canyon country there. And it has a lot of really amazing things there on the ranch. Um, so let's go up into the Rocky Mountains now, which is really a mosaic of a whole lot of different ecological systems, um, far more than you can cram into a, a short talk like this. But um, we'll start just west of town here in the foothills ecological, uh, look at some of the foothills ecological systems. Um, the one that we have right here, two of these are right here near Fort Collins. Um, this foothills shrubland that, uh, is actually a rare shrubland. Um, and also Zarek Tallgrass Prairie. Uh, some of you are going on a field trip to see Zarek Tallgrass Prairie down by Boulder, where there's some very nice stands of it. And these oak mixed mountain shrublands are uh, really dominant uh, as you go to the south, southern uh, foothills of Colorado. Um, let me just catch back up to myself here. So we have a lot of uh, species in the foothills, there's a lot of rare plants, a lot of endemism in the foothills, and um, it's a really fascinating place. It's also really threatened because it's close to where most of the people are in Colorado, and so um, it's a place where, uh, you know, like the city of Fort Collins and um, uh, Larimer County have done some amazing conservation work along the foothills, um, and um, I'd encourage all of you, if you want to go see a globally rare plant um, while you're here, just go up to the end of Horsetooth Road, the west end of Horsetooth Road, and walk up into the um, Pine Ridge Natural Area, and you can see this right now. Um, it kind of stays as a gray-green gray little rosette, um, and you can see it any time there's not snow on the ground. This is Bell's Twin Pod. And uh, Pawnee Montain Skipper is a um, listed butterfly species along the Platte. And this Preble's Meadow jumping mouse is a, a, a subspecies of endemic mouse that we've been track, uh, paying attention to, for monitoring for about 20 years. And you might also see this Leatris up at, so, up at Soapstone. A really interesting thing about our foothills are these woodland prairie relics. We've got a bunch of rare plants that are relatively common in like Wisconsin. Um, and uh, historically, the plains were a little moister and we had a woodland connection from the foothills all the way out to um, the Midwest. And um, at that time, there was contiguous habitat for some of these species. And so these are relics now here in Colorado. Um, and moving up into higher elevations, these are some of our key systems, the subalpine, um, the lodgepoles and the ponderosas. Um, and in their montane grasslands in various places, um, and, and of course at the very top, the alpine tundra. Um, a couple of really interesting species we're working on in the mountains are this, uh, the boreal toad, 
a very rare toad in Colorado that's suffering greatly now from chytrid fungus. And uh, the Townsend's big-eared bat is one of the many bats that we're monitoring now um, because of white nose syndrome. We do not yet have that in Colorado, so we're trying to detect it early on if it does come here. Western plateaus are really a hotbed for endemism in Colorado. A lot of our rarest plants are out in the Western plateaus, and we have lots of amazing landscapes out there. Um, uh, we also have some of these. Uh, this is a hanging garden in a seep on a cliff, and these are where a lot of really rare species are found. Um, we have the, uh, the black swift is here in Colorado. It only nests in Colorado behind waterfalls. I mean, there aren't very many waterfalls in Colorado, so this, this thing's a pretty rare species. Um, we also have uh, four endangered fish um, that are big water fish that live in the upper Colorado River Basin uh, way out west and go down into Utah as well. Uh, the bony tail chub is basically extinct in Colorado. It's kind of being uh, uh, propped up by hatchery, very ambitious uh, hatchery work by Parks and Wildlife. Um, so those are s some really interesting things. And this is a rare plant known from five tiny populations on these really scary cliffs. And, and these are our staff, and I need to not show this to the risk management folks at, at CSU. Um, and uh, sagebrush has been getting a lot of interest to a lot of press lately. Um, we have a lot of nice sagebrush in Colorado, uh, mainly in these two places, kind of the Gunnison Basin and up in the northwest corner. Uh, so the, the Gunnison, or the um, greater sage grouse barely makes it into Colorado. Um, and then we have an endemic grouse species, the Gunnison sage grouse, that's only found in a few little patches here and barely making it into Utah. Um, wetlands are scattered throughout Colorado, and uh, they, uh, I like this graphic because it sort of, it tells the story of the disproportionately high importance of wetlands in our state. Um, these bar, these colorful bars indicate um, numbers of species of concern in Colorado, and the transparent bars indicate the percent of the state that is occupied by that system. So wetlands occupied 2% of Colorado, but look how many species of concern, you know, nearly 25% uh, um, of them depend on wetlands. And actually about 75% of our wildlife species depend on wetlands in some stage of their life. So wetlands are an extremely important conservation target here. And so uh, here's a, a question for a room full of biologists. Um, which one of these is not a wetland? Anyone care to stick their neck out? It is a trick question, I'll give you that. Um, uh, they are actually all wetlands. And uh, the wetland types we have here are, uh, we have a fin and a riparian area, a greasewood flat, and a wet meadow. And most of Colorado's wetlands um, don't have any water visible in them, so. Another habitat that's kind of scattered throughout the state are the barrens, and I threw this in here because of their importance for rare plants. A lot of our rarest plants and endemics are found on these, and these are, uh, you know, made of, uh, you know, Green River Shale, Mancos Shale, um, and the Menifee Formation are really uh, um, what a lot of these barrens um, are underlain by and are full of rare plants. Here's a smattering of them. Um, um, two of these are listed species. Um, so to kind of wrap up the natural history part of this, um, uh, um, wanted to think about uh, our climate and what we're anticipating by 2060 is that um, the climate envelopes that our systems exist in now will not be there in 20, 2060. And so the uh, crosses here indicate our current climates in terms on a precipitation axis and a temperature axis. And you'll see that these boxes, which are the predicted um, climates of 2060, have all mostly moved outside of where our confidence intervals are for these, um, for our current uh, environmental envelopes. 
So some stuff's going to happen. We don't know exactly what that is yet. But, um, and I wanted to talk about the people of Colorado. And this bumper sticker kind of cracks me up because you'll see a lot of these here in Colorado. And, and the, most of the people who have these on their cars are about as native as the musk thistle that I am pulling out of my backyard. Um, <laughs> In fact, the musk thistle probably has more generations here than, than those people do, um, than I do. And uh, so our, um, uh, the first people to come to Colorado that we know of were the Folsom people. And when you go to Soapstone, you're going to see a nice interpretive uh, area for the, um, about the Folsom site that has been excavated at, at Lindemeyer. Um, it's a really amazing place. Um, and uh, you know the ancestral Puebloans, the Utes, Pawnees, Cherokees, Comanches, and the Cheyenne and Arapaho, um, who were who were the ones um, besieged in the Sand Creek Massacre, um, have all been here for uh, quite a long time. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I wanted to also just tell you about a few of my uh, heroines. Uh, these are a few uh, naturalists who have worked in Colorado. Alice Eastwood is probably everyone in this room's heard of her. She's amaz an amazing person who, um, she was born in Toronto and raised in a convent with her sister when her mother died. Um, there was a priest at the convent that instilled the love of botany in her. And, um, in 1873, she came out to Colorado to work with her dad and went to high school in Denver, was a valedictorian and became a high school teacher after that. Um, she did a little real estate speculation with her dad and made enough to quit the teacher job and start botanizing full time. And she was such an amazing hiker that all the, the hiking clubs, you know, she, she was the only woman in most of these hiking clubs and she out hiked everyone in there and was asked to take Alfred Russell Wallace up Gray's Peak um, because of her skill as a botanist and, and as a hiker. Um, and she collected avidly throughout Colorado. Um, and then uh, she became part of Colorado's brain drain. Um, she was uh, kind of uh, coaxed out of Colorado by uh, Mary Catherine Brandegee, who wanted her help editing the journal Zoe, which was a newly started journal. Um, and in 1892, she moved out to San Francisco to work with the Brandegees. And, and uh, around then, she also published her Flora of Denver. And Alice really became famous in um, 1906 um, in the San Francisco quake. And she, um, before that, she had done an, a, sort of innovated a new way to manage herbaria um, that now all herbaria do. They keep the type specimens in a separate case. And because she had all the type specimens in a separate case during the quake, she was able to kind of, uh, through a very perilous adventure, find her way through the rubble of the uh, California Academy of Sciences and climb up the handrail to, I think, the sixth floor and yank those um, uh, type specimens out of the case and drag them down somehow. And then she hauled them two miles or so away up over San Francisco hills in these big trunks and saved 1,211 specimens from the fire that then engulfed the Academy of Sciences. So pretty, pretty amazing person. Um, uh, and so in Colorado, we've got a few rare plants named after her. Um, Alyciella, the genus is named after Alice. Um, Cetifolia is only known from a couple sites in the far southwestern San Juans. And Mimulus eastwoodiae is another one found in Hanging Gardens in the West Slope. Uh, Alice collected this in 1892, and her type specimen is the only uh, specimen we have of this plant. Nobody's seen it yet since 1892. So this is a, a grand botanical discovery awaiting somebody, or maybe it's gone. We don't know. Um, so Mary Catherine Brandegee is another amazing woman who didn't really work in Colorado, but had a tremendous impact on Colorado's natural history by describing so many species here. And her uh, Incredible work as a botanist is also reflected in all of the species that are named after her, including Ariagana brandegii, a really rare plant here in Colorado, as well as all these other ones. Um, so she uh, lived in California. She was born in Tennessee and moved to California with her family during the, the gold rush. 
And she was only the third woman ever to enter medical school at the University of California. And when you were studying medicine back then, you were studying botany, and she really decided to become a botanist then and ended up marrying Townsend Stith in 1889, and they uh, were really a power couple. Uh, they described a lot of plants, and they, they took Alice Eastwood under their arm, and uh, Mary Catherine kind of made Alice the curator of the California Academy of Sciences, and she went and started a new herbarium in San Diego. So that's where Alice, that's how Alice got her career started in California. Another amazing woman in, uh, in Colorado's Natural History uh, Hall of Fame here is, is Hazel Schmall, and, and she actually is in the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. Um, she grew up in Ward, which is a teeny little town up above Boulder, um, and uh, she, uh, her first job after she got her master's degree was to mount all of Alice Eastwood's collections that the Colorado Natural History Society had. Um, and she, then she did her dissertation on Chimney Rock down by Mesa Verde uh, on the plants, um, on the fl flora of Chimney Rock. And um, in her career with the Colorado uh, Natural History Society, she lobbied to have the columbine become our state flower. So the columbine is our state flower because of hazel. And she also has a, a rare milk vetch that is only found um, in the Ute, uh, Ute Mountain Ute Reservation in Mesa Verde um, after her. And our last uh, profile is Jen Ackerfield, who's alive and well here at CSU um, and is running uh, the um, CSU Herbarium. Uh, she knew at a very young age that she was going to be a botanist, and she's an inspiration to many of us, to all of us at, at CNHP. Um, and she powered through writing this flora starting at around 2000 or so. Um, and she was very young. Um, and uh, despite huge personal challenges over the last 15 years, and raising a family and starting a PhD, she published this flora in 2015. And the flora of Colorado is beautiful. And I'd encourage you all to buy it if you're going to be here for more than uh, two days. Um, uh, it's a lovely book. So I wanted to kind of wrap things up here um, by sharing a poem with you uh, by uh, Thomas Hornby Farrell. He was our first uh, Colorado State Poet Laureate. Um, and his, this poem that I'm going to read you is featured on the inside of the Colorado State Capitol. And it's accompanied by, f by photos taken by Michael Menifee, who's here with us today. He's kind of CNHP's photographer. So um, here is a land where life is written in water. The west is where the water was and is. Father and son of old mother and daughter, following rivers up immensities, of range and desert thirsting the sundown ever, crossing a hill to climb a hill still drier, naming tonight a city by some river, a different name from last night's camping fire. Look to the green within the mountain cup. Look to the prairie parched for water's lack. Look to the sun that pulls the oceans up. Look to the cloud that gives the oceans back. Look to your heart and may your wisdom grow to the power of lightning and to peace of snow. So thank you very much. <laughs>